<laughs> and are you acting? Are you acting at all? Are you acting at all these days? I'm too much wired to sound. I haven't been for a couple of years now. Well, hello. Hello. I would like to welcome you to our Montana Historical Society Friends of the Society meeting. My name is Becca Cole. I'm president of the group. And I'm happy to welcome you all here to hear Pat Seiler talk about luggage. And it's my pleasure to introduce Pat. After earning a master's degree from Eastern Washington University, Pat Seiler began a career in business as owner of Livery Square Development Corporation, Livery Travel, and Going West Tours. She was named Montana Ambassador of the Year by the governor in 2004 and served as a member of the Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities. With a heart for those in need, Pat has served on numerous nonprofit boards. After selling her travel companies, she became the CEO of the Florence Crittenden Home for Pregnant and Parenting Teen Women and authored the book, The Nation's Hottest Fundraising Events. <laughs> With travel as her passion, Pat visited every continent on the globe and shared her experiences in a weekly newspaper travel column. I know we all enjoyed that. <laughs> her favorite adventures included the worldwide dinosaur expeditions she designed and escorted for paleontologist Jack Horner, Steven Spielberg's consultant on Jurassic Park. Please welcome Pat Seiler. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming this morning. I'm really looking forward to this. It's always been a passion of mine not only to travel, but to share what I happen to find along the way. So this last year, I was effortlessly wheeling my wheeling suitcase, my spinner suitcase, around the airport, and I thought, oh, Am I ever happy and grateful to that airline pilot who put wheels on luggage? And then I wondered, how did that happen? I'd like to know. So I went to research, and I found a fact that I think you will find as fascinating as I did. Do you know that we put a man on the moon in 1969 before we put wheels on, <laughs> on our suitcases? In, 19, in 1972 for the first wheels, which we'll see, and 1991 for the ones we love. So uh, with that in mind, I thought, boy, I want to know how this happened. And, and so I think I'll, I'll do a little research and, and do the evolution of luggage. So the uh, Merriam-Webster definition of luggage is something that is lugged. <laughs> And lug is the important word because even um, way back when, they, they believe that luggage comes from the word lug, which is to carry or drag a heavy object with great effort. And all of us know when you overpacked a suitcase in the 1960s what that was about. I'm going to start, you know, people have been lugging their things around since the medieval times and the ca ca uh, crusades and whatever, but uh, to, I'd like to start with the camel bags because I think this is a curious piece of luggage. These are my two little grandchildren displaying the one that I purchased in Turkey. The Turkish Anatolian nomads actually wove these beautiful big camel bags, and they were done with different designs and different colors. And this is probably the first piece of luggage that actually never needed a luggage tag because the colors and the bold designs on these bags indicated which region these nomads were from. So there we go, the first piece of luggage without a luggage tag. The Native American parflesh, uh, the parflesh containers, and there are actually two of them right on display outside this door, which is fascinating as you leave. But the Native Americans had a, a, um, an abundance of hides, of bison hides and elk hides, and so they would take these hides and they would stretch them on a frame and dry them, and with that raw hide, they would cut out and make these beautiful bags. It was usually the women that did the, uh, the bags and also that designed them. 
and very much like the, um, the camel bags, these par flesh containers were done with colors and different geometric designs, and they mostly depicted mountains and rivers, but they also depicted maps, which I think is a really interesting feature. Well, we remember the saddlebags, if you like the old Western movies, as I did. And uh, saddlebags have dated back to 700 BC. Um, and it was interesting to note that there are several kinds of saddlebags. There's a pommel saddlebag that's in the front of the saddle. There's this paired saddlebag that drapes the horse's um, hips, I guess, or behind. And, um, and then there's the little tube saddlebag, which is called the cantle saddlebag. And uh, these saddlebags were often made of, of heavy leather. And I thought, I wonder uh, what is in a saddlebag, especially because it is purported that the saying, you can't take it with you, came from the days of the saddlebags, because there's such little space to, to be utilized there. So when I, when I did a little research to see what might have been in a saddlebag, I found out that these saddlebags actually were like little survival kits. They would have a horseshoe and some nails. They would have a sharp knife. They would have some food. They might have that picket pin so the horse could be kept in place overnight. They would have either a firearm or for sure if the firearm was in a holster, they would have extra ammunition, maybe a tin plate and, uh, and also a flint with some, some kindling so they could start a fire. So um, there was quite a bit carried in those saddlebags even though uh, they said that they couldn't take it with them. Today's saddlebags, um, my friends who have ranches, I see Fady Hamilton back here, my friends who have ranches, they use a canvas pa uh, saddlebags. They're much lighter, they're much easier, and there they are with the holder for the water bottle, which you always <laughs> will see. And if you've ever been to a motorcycle rally in Sturgis or elsewhere, you'll have seen those handsome saddlebags, this man shaking his head, that actually hang on the, uh, the Harley-Davidson's. Well, as luggage continued to be developed, um, luggage was covered with, with cowhide and uh, wooden frames, but most of the luggage uh, that we see here have straps on them. And the reason they have straps on them is because they took second place to the people who were riding in the stagecoach. So if this luggage was up in the, in the dust and the rain and the snow, then it's going to be bounced around an awful lot, and it needed those straps to keep it in place. I love this painting by John Charles Meggs. It was in the collection of the Henry Ford. And you can see the action of the horses spirited and the dust and the people holding up. I always laughingly said that the sturdy luggage was only one part of it. These passengers better be sturdy as well. <laughs> In 1870, the immigrants started coming to America, and the Smithsonian historians say that 90% of the immigrants who came to America in 1870 came on the steamships. And because they didn't have money, they were usually in steerage. And so they would be bringing their belongings in baskets and in little fabric containers of some sorts. If you've ever been to the Immigration Museum in New York City and you look into one of those little display cases and see the size, the small size of those carpet bags, you know what a heartfelt experience that was deciding what to bring to the new country from yours. Around the same time, though, uh, wealthy travelers decided it was time to go out and see the world. And uh, these wealthy Americans um, found that not only did it take money to, to purchase passage on these, these beautiful ships, but it also took porters to carry these, these heavy uh, big trunks that they were taking. It's interesting, I read an article about a woman, Charlotte Drake, and Charlotte Drake ha uh, had brought a lawsuit against the White Star Line when the Titanic, sadly, had its demise. And so she had brought um, a, a claim against them it was over a million dollars, and it included 14 trunks. Now, this is one woman going on her cruise with 14 trunks. So you can see why porters became very popular in those days. 
trunks come in many sizes and many designs, and actually empty many of these trunks weigh between 80 and 100 pounds. So uh, not only are they large and bulky, but they're very heavy. Let's take a look at some of the trunks. Uh, this is the dome top trunk. It, it became popular around 1870, and I'm sure you've seen this beautiful trunk. Um, uh, they're very popular for people's cabins to keep linen in. They're also referred to as the round top camel, or the barrel, or the humpback trunk. And the, um, the, the People who own uh, antique stores say that this is the most sought-after trunk by people who come to their antique stores wanting to buy a vintage trunk. But another trunk became very popular, and I'll bet you can guess who this trunk was popular with, the steamship companies. The steamship companies loved the steamer trunks, and you can see why, because they were flat, and they could be stacked in the hold of the steamships. They were covered with either canvas or leather and always had some, some brass on them, but uh, the steamer trunks were a godsend to those big uh, ships. It's interesting because Trunks also were named after people, and they were named after destinations. So I just have two examples today uh, for you. One of them is the Jenny Lynn trunk. I think this is so handsome, this beautiful trunk. And this trunk is named after the Swedish nightingale who came to sing in the P.T. Barnum concert of 1850. Uh, you can see the distinctive hour uh, glass shape. And if you saw the movie with Hugh Jackman, uh, the... Um, the show, great showman, you'll, you'll know that this trunk uh, came from that concert series. There was also the Saratoga trunk, and the Saratoga trunk was based on the elegant trunks that wealthy people came who came to the racetracks and spas at Saratoga Springs, New York. So named after people, named after destinations, uh, trunks were everywhere. Well, here came Louis Vuitton. And he had a definite plan for his trunks, and that was to be the luxury brand. And Louis Vuitton uh, actually started as a trunk maker. And I, I read an article in a travel magazine that was quoting a man who had the Brenton uh, Village uh, trunk shop in Maine. And he said, if someone brings in a trunk to sell me uh, or has one that they want me to take a look at, and it has that little LV logo on it, I tell them something. You need to start drinking a more expensive brand of scotch. <laughs> And that was his quote. And so he uh, decided uh, that, that, that these, uh, this luggage uh, was the creme la creme. And so Louis Vuitton did start in the trunk business. But he, he founded his company in Paris in 1854. And today this distinctive monogram can be found on shoes and jewelry. And there are 500 stores uh, worldwide. And he, he still does luggage for sure. And the interesting thing is that um, he, uh, uh, his company is considered one of the top companies in the world. And just about four years ago, a women's um, alligator handbag, <laughs> not a trunk or a suitcase, a handbag sold for 54000 So I think Louis Vuitton did arrive as the, <laughs> as the trunk maker of the wealthy class. Um, but there were trunk makers in the United States coming on, too. And this is the Hartman Trunk Company uh, from Wisconsin. And where the Hartman Trunk Company made their, their mark was that they, they developed the um, wardrobe trunk. And it became popular in 1910. And it's really like a mobile closet. It opens up. It has hangers, as you can see, on one side with straps. It has little drawers for jewelry and gloves and linen on the other one. And so it's really a moving clothes closet. It, they say that um, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall had matching monogrammed Hartman trunks. And in 2015, they sold uh, Bogart's uh, initial trunk 
at an auction for 47500 So keep your eye out for chunks, especially the one with the little LV. They could be very useful to have. Um, it was kind of interesting because Hartman Company also continued to make this trunk into the 40s and 50s, and then it was made as the little children's toy trunk. And so you can imagine how much fun that was to put the dolly clothes in it. The interior of these wardrobe trunks were either lined with paper or with cotton, or the fancier ones were even lined with silk. They had platforms that folded out uh, to, for desks. They also have platforms that folded out with an ironing board, because many of these very wealthy people who went cruising took along their maids, and they took care of all the clothing during the trip. Well, now, if we think that Charlotte Drake, with her 14 trunks, was extravagant, this is something to hear. The uh, Duke and, and Duchess of Windsor, you remember Wallace Simpson, they cruised in the 30s and 40s, and they took no less than 94 pieces of luggage, and 30 of those were Louis Vuitton trunks. So there's an extravagant statement for sure. The Sampson Luggage Company started out here in the West with us in Denver in 1910 by, uh, by uh, uh, Jesse Schwe uh, Schwainer. And um, the, uh, the, their whole premises was that they actually made trunks that were very, very sturdy. sturdy. These wooden trunks could withstand anything. And in uh, 1916, they had a marketing coup that said, strong enough to stand on. So you know where their name Samsonite came from. It's that biblical character, Samson, who you know had the, the strength of all this. And uh, so there's Jesse with his brothers and his fathers telling him, this is the trunk to buy, our strong one. We wouldn't want to leave without talking about the uh, military trunks. And these photographs are of the uh, metal military trunks from 1914 to 1918. And, uh, but trunks have been used in the, with the military forever and way, way back even before. And they're called foot lockers because they stand at the foot of their bed or their bunk and they hold their belongings. And my father was a very proud Marine. And I was pleased to see that the Marine Recruiting Academy and he still refers to these as footlockers. So there we go. Well, along came the suitcase. And so the suitcase came along for several reasons, mostly because transportation was changing. Um, now there was People were going in carriages. They were going in trains and needed to slide that suitcase under the seat. They had automobiles on the scene. And so people wanted to be able to take their suitcase with them. Of course, the supporters were still there to help, but the suitcase really arrived at this time. The trunks were far too big and cumbersome. People say, well, where did the name suitcase come from? Well, it came from the days of the trunks, actually, because the, uh, the people on the dock would refer to those wardrobe trunks as the suit case, two words, the suit case, and then it was combined to be the suitcase. Um, a suitcase it has an interesting description. I love the last of the description. First, it says it is a rectangular um, a size. It has rounded or square corners. It has a handle. It can be covered with canvas or leather or other things. It, um, it opens like a door with a hinge and it always retains its shape. So we're not talking about the duffel bag here. We've got to talk about the suitcases. Um, this is a suitcase from 1910 called the Gladstone. And this is actually a leather's doctor bag because that's what the Gladstone looked like. It had the leather surface and then it had a metal or a um, wooden top uh, where the opening was and a handle. I happened to be in Massachusetts last summer at the Norman Rockwell Museum. Don't we love him? Oh, I just loved going and looking at all the different um, paintings and different prints. Uh, but um, as I was looking at this one, I saw this little girl and I went, aha! Uh -huh. Look what's at her feet. It's a Gladstone suitcase. So uh, it seems that some of these things we learn just keep kind of poking their way into our world. 
By 1910, there were locks and keys. And if you've ever cleaned out the luggage of one of your relatives and you've been in the attic, you may have come across a bag or a box with uh, all these little keys. And uh, one could kind of wonder which suitcase could the keys possibly go to. But I have a good friend, Beverly, from Seattle who said, oh, Pat, it was never a problem. I could always open those suitcases with a bobby pin. <laughs> So, but it's interesting because Louis Vuitton, we remember him with his very expensive trunks, he um, had said that the locks were his specialty, and he had challenged Houdini to come and break a lock from one of his trunks, but Houdini declined, so what can we say? <laughs> Okay, so, so the suitcases had various covers. Um, jute was very popular in the 1920s, and jute is that little slippery vegetable um, that we know for uh, twine, for garden twine. I also learned something interesting. Jute is only second to cotton in consumption in the world. So we can see why in the 20s uh, it was a good uh, cover for suitcases. This, I think, is my favorite suitcase, not even the Louis Vuitton, but when you look at the Depression-era cardboard suitcase, you have to just smile to think, how many people used this? Where were they going? Um, and uh, it's a humble suitcase, but it was a suitcase of the era. Well, we've heard of tweed suits, but there were also tweed suitcases. But this is my, one of my favorite stories about suitcases. Um, the Oshkosh Company was in Milwaukee. Uh, they were a suitcase manufacturer. And in 1930, they discovered a warehouse filled, just filled, with a canvas. And it was filled with this canvas. It's, the stripe is called the Chief, after a chief from Wisconsin. And it was used for the diplomatic pouches for the Spanish Embassy. And after the Spanish-American War ended, then all of this canvas was just stored in this warehouse. So this Oshkosh company got this out, made a prototype, and took it to some of the fancy department stores and said, what color should we paint this canvas suitcase so it would be attractive to your customers? And they said, oh, don't paint it. This has personality. We like it just as it is. So for years on the, uh, on the train platforms in different places, you would see the Oshkosh suitcase from far away. Suitcases, yes, were uh, mostly rectangular, but there were hat boxes and suitcases in the round. And there were also vintage pet carriers. So those of you who have a pet, you could imagine what it was like back then to carry your pet along in one of these unique, unique and, and charming pet carriers. The travel decals just... Uh, say it all when you see them. Uh, we know that people collected them, uh, they loved them, and not only did they somewhat say, you know, uh, I was there and I'm remembering my experience, but they also kind of said, I'm an adventurer. I'm out seeing the world. And uh, it's interesting because the um, antique dealers say, if a suitcase has uh, decals on them and travel decals, uh, it's worth much more. I also learned that uh, back in the days of the trunks, it, a trunk was not considered a true antique unless it was 100 years old and it had never been restored. Well, the, the vintage luggage is not certainly ending up in the dump. It has its life of its own coming along. And people are using it to decorate, uh, many times making coffee tables out of the beautiful trunks. But here a little bookcase and even a nightstand. Samsonite, as we talked about, named after Samson and uh, uh, in Denver, Colorado, was really one of the forerunners, and did they ever advertise? I think that's what probably made them so successful. They bought advertising everywhere, and uh, they were really on the right track uh, <laughs> doing their advertising because it made their company so recognized, so well recognized. But I had to smile because I thought not only did they per 
purport to sell you a fine suitcase, they made some promises that seemed a little far-fetched. So if you bought Samsonite luggage for your student, they are going to have a bright future. And if you're going to carry it yourself, you may have romance with the captain of either the <laughs> ship or the airlines. And of course, Santa would say, you are the smart person to give the right gift. Luggage was not initially unisex. Women and men had their own designs and their own colors. Women had collections with all kinds of various sizes, and men had um, attache and, and briefcases to match. You know, in the last 15, 20 years, we're, we've fallen in love with that bla the black suitcase uh, uh, and how many of, of us carry that, that black suitcase. But I always told in my travel uh, stories, you got to put something on that. You've got to put a ribbon or some kind of a, t a unique tag, not to find your own luggage at the carousel, but to make sure someone doesn't take yours home. And I've had many tours that I've led across the globe. One time we were in Romania on a dinosaur dig, and um, uh, one of the women, her black suitcase was gone. We got to the hotel, and here comes someone uh, kind of frantic. It was the ambassador who took her suitcase <laughs> home. So there we go, kind of an elegant story. The, the best-selling bridal gift in the 50s and 60s, the train case. Doesn't this make us smile? We've all had uh, probably a train case or uh, uh, have seen them and enjoyed them. The best-selling bridal gift. Well, now suitcases were really coming on the scene with colors and different patterns. And as you can see by this small ad um, to the lower here, if you had a plain brown suitcase and you thought it was boring, you could buy a Mod Podge kit. <laughs> they sold them in the marketplace, and you could change your suitcase to whatever design you wanted to change it. And do you remember this contraption? I call it a contraption. The awkward metal luggage carrier. Oh, my heavens. I remember those. I mean, they were just as awkward as they could be. I mean, they could actually, you know, injure you, I'm sure. So the awkward metal luggage carrier was that. But here we come. Exciting. Did you know, and we talked about it, that we put a man on the moon in 1969 before we thought to put wheels on luggage. Now, the first luggage with wheels was invented by Bernard Sado. And there's an interesting New York uh, uh, Times article. And he actually was coming home from Aruba with big, heavy suitcases with his wife and family and hauling him through customs uh, when he looked over and he saw a a a porter with a wheeled cart, and he thought, wheels, that's what we need. He was the vice president of a luggage company, and he went home and he decided we should have wheels on a suitcase. He invented it in 1970, he patented it in 91, and he rolled it out in 92. He had high hopes, but didn't, things didn't go the way he had hoped. This suitcase, I don't know if any of you remember it, was a suitcase on four wheels with the strap that you pulled. The reason it didn't make it, I believe, is because it was awkward, but the reason it didn't make it, according uh, to Bernard uh, Sado in a CNN interview when he was 85, he said that the porters, they didn't like this idea at all. They were still carrying luggage around and making tips. And this was a threat to them for sure. And they started saying, any man who would be pulling a suitcase was a sissy, was an absolute sissy. Well, the luxurious department stores heard about this and they thought, we're not going to market to sissies. This is not going to make it. So poor Bernard, his suitcase was very short-lived uh, for sure. But here comes the inventor, Robert Plath. And Robert Plath started tinkering in his garage 16 years later. Can you believe? It took that long before we thought, this was a good idea. Let's try to change the design. 16 years later, Robert Plath started tinkering in his garage. And he started thinking about 
making a suitcase with wheels that could be just pulled with a handle. And he thought, this would be a, a good idea for pilot friends. So he made a prototype for himself, and then he s introduced it to his friends who were pilots. He was a Northwest Airline pilot. And then he got the uh, flight attendants to, to pull these suitcases through the airports. And he gave everybody $5 if they would coax somebody else to buy one of his suitcases. He sold them for about $129. Well, the general public saw them, and that's all it took. And so um, by 1991, he had started Travel Pro his company, Travel Pro. He retired as a pilot, and the rest is history. And it's kind of interesting because his first suitcase was called the Rollerboard, which is interesting because, like, roll it on to aboard the plane. So it's kind of so that it was the Rollerboard, and, and he developed it. It's kind of interesting, too, that we need to give credit to um, Don Ku, KU, who actually invented the retractable handle um, that was on the uh, Travel Pro suitcases. Here came the spinner suitcase, which I think is so fabulous, especially if you're taking trains in Europe and the little narrow hallways, you can spin this suitcase around. And what do we think about the children's? wheel luggage. I mean, there are three-year-olds, and they are so proud. They're puffed up, and they're pulling these suitcases everywhere. And since I was in the business uh, as a businesswoman, I love the idea of another generation of travelers getting the idea of getting out and seeing the world. But guess what has come on the market now? The smart suitcase. This has actually been marketed for two years, the smart suitcase. And um, the smart suitcase actually does so many incredible things. If they waited so many years that put wheels on suitcases, if they waited 16 years between the, uh, the little, uh, I call it the little dog suitcase, uh, the little pull-along suitcase and the other one, they, they've taken off now. Suitcase manufacturers have taken off. The smart suitcase does many things. The large pieces are valuable because the suitcase weighs the contents, so you don't have to wonder if you're going over 50 pounds. It charges your phone, and the, and the carry-ons charge your, your phone and your, and your laptop and, and all of those things. It tracks via your phone and notifies you when your luggage has come to the, to the turnstile and lets you know. Uh, it, it's just got all kinds of different features, and it's actually been on the market for two years. It's, um, it's interesting because there's uh, in the beginning, there was some talk about the airlines not allowing them, and you probably read that. Because of the lithium ion batteries, they said, oh no, you know, if we put them in the, uh, the luggage uh, part of the plane, the hold, uh, they're going to start a fire. Well, smart suitcases have smart manufacturers. So what did they decide? We're going to make them retractable. We'll make them easily popped out. And if they are carried onto the plane in carry-on, it's OK to put them, that, uh, put them there, and it's OK to fly. So the large suitcases, people pop them out before they check their luggage. And um, the carry-on suitcases, they pop them out as well. And so the smart suitcase is on the market. There are many different brands now. Um, some, of the, uh, some of them have uh, uh, various colors. Uh, there's just lots of lots of features that they have. Some of them, if they get away from you, there's an alarm that uh, goes off and let somebody know somebody's stealing your suitcase, and uh, it's interesting. I don't know if you ever watched the Jetsons when you were younger. <laughs> My sister and I loved the Jetsons, that animated sitcom on television. And we would always dream of what it would be like to have the Jetsons. Well, these products are actually on the market. They're on the market. In fact, oh, that's OK. I turned mine off. Uh, the, uh, they're actually on the market today. And interestingly enough, if you're at your computer or laptop someday and you just want to take a peek at what's new in the suitcases, you will be amazed. There's actually a suitcase that opens, uh, a fairly large suitcase. It unzips. And then it has two little handles. And when you pull it out, 
it has shelves. It has uh, shelves, uh, fabric shelves. So there are your sweaters, and there are your slacks, and there are something else. And then you just lower it back down into your suitcase and zip it up. It's called the shelf suitcase. Uh, they have suitcases that um, uh, become desks with little chairs so you can keep going at your work. They have suitcases uh, that become scooters. So if you just have a carry-on, <laughs> You, you, pick, you come right off the plane and you're heading to your apartment downtown New York. And speaking of, of downtown New York, there's actually a suitcase that's been developed um, for European travelers because their apartments are so small, as you know, and if you've rented one, you've backed, <laughs> backed out. Well, there's a suitcase that's a full-size suitcase, strong enough to collapse to three inches and slides under the bed. So a suitcase manufacturers are listening to the general public and wanting to know uh, what to do. Well, I cannot believe that since I thought about doing this, I actually had to add another slide, another slide for this presentation because of the robotic suitcase. Now, I used to give so many travel uh, presentations, and I would always say, I'm waiting for the robot, the robot that will pack my luggage and unpack it when I come home. Well, it's not packing your luggage yet, but it is actually carrying it. This robotic suitcase by TravelMate, and there's one by Away and other companies, actually travels along side of you or behind you three to about um, th uh, five feet. Uh, it has all the features the smart suitcase has. Um, it has a sensor so that it doesn't bump into anything, including a child, I hope. And, um, and it, it's, um, it's just a, an incredible piece. It also will travel, this, this travel mate will travel horizontal, so you can pile a few extra things on if you've shopped a lot and, uh, and let it take it with you. The robotic suitcase um, is on the market today. It's, uh, it's here to buy if you choose it. It has all kinds of bells and whistles. But I just read an article by Condé Nast, and they said, no. <laughs> we, we like the idea of the smart suitcase. That one we can take. Uh, but uh, 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 a robot following us around sounds like it's going to clog the airports and take more time in security. But if you want a robotic suitcase, it's on the market today. So since we just left the holiday season, and I was in the travel industry, I have a wish for all of you. May your luggage always go in the same direction as you. <laughs> Whether it's robotic or not, right? And above all, may you enjoy the ride. So thank you very, very much. <laughs>